Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin. I would like to welcome you to the Active Doctors Online August webinar recognizing National Immunization Awareness Month. Today we will discuss the diseases prevented by immunization, how immunizations work, and what are the risks involved both being and not being immunized. Today's speaker is clinical assistant professor from Georgetown University and Active Doctors Online Medical Director, Dr. Howard Sahalski. Dr. Sahalski, welcome. Thank you very much, Caitlin. So today we're going to talk about immunizations, and let's go on to the next slide. So to start with, I'm going to go back a little bit on the history of immunizations. Um, before they were called immunizations or vaccinations, they were referred to as inoculations, and there are references to inoculations back as far as 1500 BC in India, although the inoculations back then were considered religious rites and were probably not done to actually prevent disease so much as to keep away evil beings. The first actual vaccination as we now know them was the smallpox vaccine which was first developed in 1798. An interesting bit of trivia, smallpox, the disease, was and up until recently still was treated by a vaccination based on the cowpox disease. You would give a small amount of cowpox, which your body would recognize as smallpox, and it would prevent your body from being susceptible to smallpox. The virus, smallpox is a virus, as is cowpox, and the cowpox virus that we would inject people with to keep them from getting smallpox has a Latin name variole vaccinae, V-A-C-C-I-N-A-E. And it's from that virus, variole vaccinae, that the term vaccination comes from. Originally, vaccination was considered only the inoculation for smallpox. But in 1881, Louis Pasteur, very famous historical doctor, decided and coined the term vaccination to refer to all inoculations. The first measles vaccine and the first repetitive vaccine that we give regularly to children was developed in 1963 and was improved in the subsequent years. So that's how vaccines first started to be around and how the term vaccination first came to be around. But we have a lot more vaccinations now than just smallpox and measles, as we will see on the next slide. So this is a very busy slide, and it's not meant for you to read the whole slide, so much as to point out the challenges that doctors, frequently pediatricians, have to go through in order to give all of the current vaccinations. This lists all the times for all of the vaccinations that we routinely give children from birth up through 18 years old. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of overlapping vaccinations and a lot of pediatric visits that you have to give two, three, four, or even five vaccines at the same time, um, making it a little hard on the kids. They go, go and they end up getting a lot of shots, but as we will discover later on, it is all worth it. So what are these diseases that we are vaccinating? And we have those listed on the next slide. So here is a partial list, actually, of the diseases that can be prevented with vaccination. Um, diphtheria, which is an upper respiratory tract disease and is part of the DPT shot. Haemophilus influenza, um, which can cause meningitis or a brain infection in children. Hepatitis A, which is a waterborne gastroenterological disease, causes a lot of, bite, of vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. And I'm not going to read every single one. Later on, you see varicella, which is also known as chickenpox pertussis, which is also known as whooping cough, and a lot of other vaccines you see on there. Smallpox, which is the third from the bottom on the second column, has actually been officially eradicated. So as of 1979, we actually stopped giving the smallpox vaccine, and it's considered one of the greatest vaccine success stories. Let's go on to the next slide. So this is my then and now beginning slide. Back in 1983, there were only 10 vaccines on the mandatory vaccine schedule by the C CBC. And as you can see, it was really only a few different shots. Um, 
you have the DPT shot, which includes diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, the OPV shot, which was polio. And the MMR shot, of which there was only one given and just at 15 months of age, which is measles, mumps, and rubella. So there's actually seven diseases covered, but a grand total of 10 shots um, given over the first four years. And that was as recently as just 20, slightly over 20 years ago, that the total amount of shots that a kid got growing up was just these 10 shots. Now let's look at what we're doing now. So you already saw that busy slide earlier on, and here is the list of the total vaccine schedule that kids get between birth and six years old. And you can see there are a total of 38 shots, sometimes as low as 36. You can see at 24 months there is the PPSV, which is the pneumococcus shot. It's a shot for pneumonia. We give it a lot to 60-year-olds and people with emphysema later in life. But for at-risk children, oftentimes children with immune issues or children with asthma, we give the pneumonia shot for the high-risk children. What has been added to the schedule? Well, you can see a lot of things. Um, first, some of the things that we were giving, we now give more of. For instance, MMR appears multiple times, twice on the schedule now, and it only was once before. We found that 93% of people are immune after one shot, but that it goes up to 97% if we give two shots. So we give an extra shot now, um, one at 12 months and one at 48 months. <clears throat> We've also added the rotavirus shot, which is a, again, like hepatitis, a gastroenterological infection. It causes profuse diarrhea and vomiting in young children. We've added the pneumonia shot, as we talked about. We added some hepatitis shots. And that's just until age six. Then there are some additional shots um, that we are now giving to older children. For instance, the human papilloma shot that um, young women and now young men are getting starting as early as nine years old. So obviously, the number of vaccines that we're giving to children in general has dramatically, dramatically increased. Now, what are these shots doing? And on the next slide, we'll talk about the different ways that shots work. They all start with one basic mechanism of action. In the vaccine, you are giving an antigen. An antigen is doctor speak for something that your body recognizes as an invader. We give something that your body will see, know it's an invader, and make antibodies to. Antibodies are these proteins that your body makes that are the soldiers of your body. They go and they attack foreign invaders. So you give a shot of these antigens. Your body recognizes that they're invaders, but they are either deactivated or partial invaders. And your body learns to recognize them so that if the actual bacteria or the actual virus invades your body, if you get an infection, before it can spread throughout your body, your body says, ah, I remember that and sends its antibodies, its soldiers, to destroy the invaders. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can make antigens. And on the next slide, we're going to see some of the ways that your body, that the scientists have come up with antigens. So in the middle, the central picture, which has the arrows coming out from it, is a virus, a typical invader. It might be the polio virus. It might be the smallpox virus. It might be the chickenpox virus. And a virus has a shell wrapped around it with proteins, those little things that look like mushrooms coming out of it. Those are proteins. Every virus, every bacteria has a coating that includes proteins that are basically the name tag that everything has. Deep within it is DNA. Just like every cell, deep inside the virus, you have the DNA, the blueprint for creating that virus or that bacteria. There are lots of ways to create an antigen based on this, in this case, virus. You can see going around the outside, you can give a whole inactivated virus. What that means is you've taken the DNA out but left everything else in, in there. That means that the virus can't replicate, it can't um, grow inside the human body, but it's still 
is recognizable to your antibodies as an invader, so helps your body prepare. There's the live attenuated. This is a virus that has been treated so that it can't actually hurt you. The problem with live attenuated virus, and for instance, polio is a live attenuated virus, is that very, very rarely it can unattenuate itself. You think you have completely deactivated, but since it is a live virus, it is capable of turning back into an actual virus and sometimes causing the infection. There are very, very few vaccines we use anymore that are live attenuated viruses that come with any risk of actually causing the disease. For the flu shot, you may be familiar with the flu shot, usually given as a once a year shot in your arm. Some people don't want to take another shot, so there is a nasal form. You spray a nose spray of flu into your nose. That also is a live attenuated vaccine, even though it is not a shot, um, that very rarely can cause the flu. But the shot itself is not. That contains no live flu virus. So some of the other ways that don't actually include virus is pieces of those proteins that are on the outside or pieces of the DNA itself. All of these allow your body to recognize the invader and to be ready should you get exposed to it again. Now, why do we give two or three shots of the same thing to some people? Well, because imagine you were walking through a crowd looking for a bad guy, and someone put a bad guy into that crowd, and he's wearing all black and carrying a big gun. He should be easy to notice, but sometimes you just miss him. He sneaks behind somebody and you just miss him. Sometimes you can give a shot of antigen, and your body just misses it and isn't ready for it when it comes again. By exposing your body multiple times, you increase the chance that your body will notice this invader and be ready for it should you actually be exposed to the actual infection. Let's go on to the next slide. So why do we give all of these vaccines? What good are we doing? And this is a slide to point out just how important it is that we are vaccinated. Polio, for instance. Before the polio vaccine, there were 13 to 20,000 cases of paralytic polio a year, which mainly affected children. 13 to 20,000 children would end up with partial paralysis every year. Measles. Before there was the measles shot, everyone got the measles. It was just kind of like a rite of childhood. Everyone got the measles. And it actually killed 450 people, usually children a year. For reference sake, Last year, there were just 600 cases of the measles, and we'll get back to that, as opposed to every child getting the measles. And in recent years, the number of measles cases has been a low, as low as 34. Now, why does anyone still get the measles? Well, there's a lot of reasons that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. But the main ones are people from out of the country. Not everybody in every country gets the measles shot, and so some people end up visiting here or traveling from another country and being here, and they end up coming down with the measles, which they probably brought with them from their home country. Haemophilus influenza. This is another bacteria that I mentioned earlier that can cause meningitis or brain infection as kids. Before we started giving the Haemophilus influenza shots, H. flu killed 600 kids a year. And pertussis, or whooping cough, now part of the DPT shot, killed 9,000 kids a year worldwide before we developed the DPT shot. So it is very clear on this slide, it shows the decrease in morbidity, that's number of people sick, for all of these diseases compared to before and after there were vaccines. And you can see that for almost all of these diseases, you are 90% or above in terms of the decrease in the amount of infections and in many cases, death because of our vaccination program. Let's go on to the next slide. So no vaccine lecture would be complete these days without at least paying attention to the controversy surrounding vaccines, namely vaccines and do they cause autism. Autism, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a learning disability where children, usually in the four to six-year-old age group, develop 
problems with socializing, problems with eye contact, communication, empathy. We used to call these weird kids. Now we have been able to identify what the problem is with the socialization, although not the specific cause. And we have a label for it, autism. The concern about vaccines and autism started about 10 years ago when there was a group of children and their parents who came together and noted about 10 years ago that right after getting the MMR vaccine, shortly thereafter they developed a fever and their socialization skills, their language skills, seemed to profoundly decrease and it happened right after a doctor's visit where they got the MMR. And this caused a nationwide concern that the, something in the MMR vaccine may be causing autism. In particular, there was a chemical in the MMR vaccine called thermosol. Thermosol contained a certain type of mercury, and mercury poisoning in adults looks surprisingly like what autism is known to look like now. So there was a big concern that thermosol may be causing autism in children. Since then, there have been a number of studies that showed that thermosol, in all likelihood, I say, does not cause autism. Since 2001, we've actually had thermosol and thermosol-free versions of every shot that has thermosol in it, and retrospective studies have shown that the kids who got the non-thermosol vaccine did um, no better in terms of autism than the kids who got the thermosol vaccine. The end result is we really, really don't think that autism is caused by the MMR shots, by the thermosol, or by vaccines in general. However, there are still definitely people who feel that after getting their shots, their child regressed and developed autism. Why is that? In fact, in 1980, one in 10,000 ch children were diagnosed with autism, and in 2013, it was one in 50. You've already seen the data earlier in this lecture about how the number of vaccines has dramatically increased. Couldn't it possibly be re related, autism possibly be related to the vaccines? In medicine, you can never say never. So I don't want to go on record or have anyone think that I say it is absolutely impossible that vaccines are related to autism. But we have absolutely no scientific evidence to back that up. And the dramatic rise in autism can be related to many, many other factors. What are some of those factors? Well, certainly we diagnose autism a lot more now than we did then. As I said earlier, we used to not have a label or people studying the disease nearly as much. So a lot of parents just thought they had different children, did not bring them to medical attention, and they never got labeled as autistic. Autism is also strongly linked with the age of the mother and possibly even the age of the father at the time of conception. So in the last 25 years, there has been a definite trend towards older age at becoming a parent. And that older age of conception is probably at least partially to blame for this rise in autism. But again, we don't have any evidence, any good evidence whatsoever, that there is a link between autism and vaccine. Let's go on to the next slide. Yet the fear persists. There are definitely people who are afraid of giving their kids all of these vaccines, despite the dramatic decrease in disease, para paralysis, and death since we instituted vaccines. And many parents, especially in the coastal states where some states, for instance California, have passed laws making it legal to opt out of having your child vaccinated. Well, California passed that law and that dramatic rise from 34 cases of measles to over 600 cases of measles in the last couple of years was mostly because of an outbreak in California centered around Disney World. Here you have a picture of Mickey as he would look like if he had measles. Sorry, not Disney World, Disneyland. Disneyland in California. And because 
more and more parents are unfortunately not vaccinating their children because of concerns of vaccines and their potential link to autism, you are putting your children at risk, they are putting their children at risk of increased disease and there was a dramatic uptick in measles. Part of the way that vaccines work, remember I said the measles vaccine or the MMR vaccine, even at its best, even with two shots, only is 97% effective. There's 3% of people wandering around who are not immune to measles. Yet why has there been such a dramatic decrease in measles? We call it herd vaccination. If everyone gets vaccinated, then even if there's one person out there who's not immune, if no one around him can get it, then he won't be able to get the disease. He won't have anyone to catch it from. But with more and more people not vaccinating, saying, well, my child will be protected because all of the kids around him will be vaccinated. Well, if everyone thinks that way and nobody gets vaccinated, then you lose this herd immunization where you there's no one for you to catch it from. And then you end up with a chain reaction of the disease running through the community, which is what happened in Disneyland last year. So. In summary, I will say that vaccination is very important. It prevents a lot of diseases, a lot of diseases which have a history of actually killing a lot of children. There does not appear to be any good evidence to link it to autism, and I would say the importance of vaccinating yourself and your children against the necessary diseases cannot be understated, despite the fact that there seems to be a whole slew of things that we need to vaccinate kids against these days. Let's go on to the next slide. So how can active doctors online help you, especially with vaccination? Well, with our personal health records, we have a revolutionary platform where all of your records are kept online. Because of this, if you change doctors, if you change pediatricians, if you grow up and you leave your pediatrician and you go to your regular doctor, there's no chance of losing records of all of those vaccines. I can't tell you how many people I have had to revaccinate because they needed proof of vaccination, but their last time they got vaccinated was at their pediatrician 10 years ago, and the pediatrician has retired since then, or it was too hard to get the old records. So it was easier for them just to get extra shots that they don't need. With Active Doctor's personal health record, Losing old records is never a problem. We get your records for you, we upload the records, we will list the vaccines that you have had in a system that will always be there if you need, if you need it. If you're in a different doctor's office, if you're in a different state, if you're in a different country, your records go with you. In addition, we have our online second medical opinion. So if you do come down with any strange disease, a a preventable one or not, you can request a second opinion from one of our thousands of doctors and specialists who will be able to, within 48 hours, give you their opinion based on the records in your personal health record. And finally, if you are concerned about vaccines, where you are in your schedule, vac what vaccines you might need, and your doctor is a contributing and participating member with Active Doctors Online, you can have an e-consultation through our system which allows you to teleconference with your doctor in a way that prevents you from needing to go all the way to the doctor for what might just be an easy question about your vaccination schedule or anything else. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Caitlin to finish telling you more about Active Doctors Online. Thank you, Dr. Zahalski, for that informative webinar on what is sure to be a controversial topic. At ADO, of course, our vision is to educate, engage, and empower our members to take control of their health destiny to save time, money, and even lives. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation, and we invite you to start a 30-day free trial of Active Doctors Online. Simply head over to our website, www.activedoctorsonline.com, and click Get Started on the homepage. If you'd like more information about the webinar or have any questions about the services, please feel free to contact Dr. Zahalski or myself directly via email. You can also reach us on social media on Facebook at Active Doctors Online and Twitter at Active Doctors. Thank you, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar.